Well, it's always a joy to open the Bible, and we're coming to the end of the Gospel of John. And these passages in John 21 may be some of the most dear and precious in the entire Gospel. Jesus' very heart and his nature comes out, and so we want to take a look at that today. We're looking forward again, as you've heard, about the AGM this weekend, and uh, on Saturday morning we'll do that. Uh, I want to encourage you to, to join our Zoom call. We want to think about what it means to reopen uh, and gather together and be prepared for when we can do that, and we would be welcoming your feedback and thoughts. Um, so, so join us on Saturday morning. Let's take a look this morning at John 21, where we see the welcoming embrace of Jesus. Now, my grandparents had this very great hobby. It, in fact, it was more than a hobby that my grandparents had. They loved to take old furniture and restore it. They'd, they'd take beaten down items and they'd make them into something that looked absolutely beautiful. I was the privileged recipient of a gift that they gave to me, a gift of an old cedar chest. It was from the early 1900s. It still had the, uh, the certificate on the inside of the lid. And, and when I opened the lid and there was that great fresh smell of, of cedar that, that was there, it was a, a great, great gift. And yet, this cedar chest had not always been so glorious. When my grandparents had received it, it had dents and nicks. The finish had worn off and the luster was gone. The, the shimmer and the shine was now a, a dullness. And it, it looked weather-worn and stained. And so, taking a bit of sandpaper and gently rubbing it down and finishing it off, and putting on the stain and the finish, it became this beautiful chest that just had all of the luster and, and beauty. It, it was, it's built with that fine craftsmanship of the early 1900s, so sturdy and firm, and, and it sits in our home, and, and every time I see it, I'm always reminded of this precious gift that I received. What makes the gospel such good news is that like that cedar chest that was worn and lacks the luster and joy, the gospel comes and it takes sinners and it says that they can not only be forgiven, but also restored. You see, we have been made in God's image. We've been made in His likeness, but, but sin has worn off that shine and that finish and that luster. And what it has done to us is that the, the original sin of the garden has marred all of us, that we are marred and that we do not perfectly reflect the image of God. But in John 21, what we have is this beautiful, moving scene that anyone who comes to Christ by faith can be received, forgiven, and restored. And just as John has said that he has written these things so that we might believe and that we might have life in the name of Jesus, we find here the account of Peter. Peter who comes as one who has confessed, who has fallen greatly, but now is restored by the very Lord Jesus. The gospel, you see, is, is not just for people who've made little mistakes or people who've blown it, but rather it's even for those who are the deniers, the disappointers, the failures, those who look at their lives and come to Jesus and say, can you even use a life like mine? I've blown it so badly. And in John 21, what we see is the very heart of Jesus. And we see two things this morning, that, that as we look at the very heart of Jesus, the first thing we see is the welcoming embrace of Jesus. Now here's the scene. John 21. The disciples have left. They've left Jerusalem. They've gone about 80 miles north to Galilee. And when they get to Galilee, they've, they've now been away from, from all of the bustle of the city. And Peter, we're told in John 21, he has, 
he has taken six of the other disciples out and gone fishing. Peter, who knows the lake well, who's been out there fishing many times, they're out there casting their nets all night, pulling them back in to not catch anything. When as they come close to shore, what they find is a man standing on the shore. Light is just starting to break through the darkness. The, the dawn is beginning to emerge. It's, it's still a little bit dusky. You can't quite see clearly, but, but there is Jesus on the shore. And as they come close to the shore, they see the fire and the man cooking, and he calls to them, have you caught any fish? Cast your nets on the other side. They do that, and they bring in this enormous haul, John tells us, of 153 fish, so much that it's, it's causing, they're, they're struggling to bring it in. When John looks then, he sees and he says, it's the Lord, and, and Peter, in all of his impulsiveness, jumps over. He puts on his robe, jumps over the side, swims hard to shore, going hard, going fast. And when he gets to shore, as the disciples pull up, he's dragging in the net, and he comes before Jesus, and there is Jesus with a meal. Fresh fish, cooked, and bread, prepared by the Lord. And here by this charcoal fire, Jesus feeds his disciples. He welcomes them. He gives them something to eat. And now as the meal is coming to an end, there's no sense of condemnation, accusation, or, or the, the mention of failure. There's no harshness here. In fact, the entire scene is one where the, the picture that we, we see is, welcome, come, eat. Jesus, we are told, in Luke 15, he's described as the friend of sinners. And when the Pharisees saw Jesus, they accused him of well, coming and eating with sinners and tax collectors. This was their accusation in Luke 15, verses 1 and 2. What is it about Jesus that sinners seem drawn to him? They come to him. They, they want to be near him. What is it about the very nature of Jesus that draws in people with moral ugliness, moral uncleanness? What we find is, like Peter, who casts himself over the side of the boat, swimming hard for shore, going to Jesus, is that we find a Savior who is full-hearted, who is unrestrained in his compassion, whose love is abounding and overflowing. And this seems so strange to you and me. It seems strange because we're restrained in our compassion. We're hesitant. We're self-protective. We don't want to let our full hearts go because we know that if we let our full hearts go, we could very easily be hurt. But in Jesus, there is no restraint at all. There is no hesitation. There, there is no self-protection. The, the very heart of Jesus that we see in John 21 is the very heart of God Himself. As I prayed at the very outset, I was praying some of the words from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul, he, he says these words to the Corinthians. He says to them, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. And here we have the very nature of God, the very heart of God. What is He like? Thomas Goodwin, who was the six, uh, 17th century pastor in England, he, he was known as the Augustine of the Puritans. He, he says that God has a multitude of mercies for, of every kind. 
When, when Thomas Goodwin looked at that verse from 2 Corinthians 1.3, the God of all comfort and mercies, the Father of all comfort and mercies, he couldn't help but see that, that the, the very nature of God is abounding in mercy, flowing with mercy, that what, what oozes out of Him is mercy upon mercy upon mercy. But you might say, but Paul says that that, that is the God of all comfort, the Father. But what about Jesus? And when Jesus spoke to his disciples in John 14, one of, the, one of the questions that his disciples had for him was about the very nature of Jesus' heart and God's heart. Philip had said to Jesus in John 14, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to Philip, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? In other words, Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What, what, what God is like, what God the Father is like, is exactly what I am like, my, my nature. That, that the very heart of God, the, the oneness of God in His heart it's not divided by the Trinity, but rather His nature is consistent. He is, he is the God who never changes. And because of this, we, we see this scene then on the beach. The fire. A warmth. Light in the midst of darkness. Food after a long, hard night of fishing and a welcoming Savior. I think that there is this idea that many of us have that Jesus, He abounds in forgiveness, but that somehow He's still somewhat disappointed. If only we could get our acts together. If, if only we wouldn't mess up so much. We, we have this lingering doubt that somehow we're still a disappointment to Jesus. And in that disappointment, we, we sense that maybe he's, maybe he's just forgiving because he has to. But here in John 21, what we find is that in the ugliness of our sin, what draws Christ to us is not our loveliness, but in fact it is our unloveliness that draws us to Him. This is not how the world works. This isn't how you and I even work. It's not how we think or we practice life. We, we go through life with this sense that somehow we're still a disappointment because we fall short. But Jesus' embrace, it's a wide, open-armed embrace. It's the embrace of a Savior. It's, it's the picture of Luke 15, the, the father of the prodigal son, who is looking out on the road, waiting for his son to come home. And when he sees his son afar off, he, he runs to his son. And as his son begins his speech, Father, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be called your son. The father interrupts. Fat, slaughter the fattened calf, put on a robe and a ring. My lost son has been found. <clears throat> and this is the very nature of Jesus. The wide open arms of welcome. But I want you to also see the wide open arms of the restoring embrace of Jesus. Here in John 21, we're given a bunch of details. We saw them a bit last week. The, the details of there's a fire. 
a charcoal fire. There's a threefold confession after three questions. And, and the scene repeats what we've already seen before. Peter by a fire in John 18, 18, a charcoal fire, denying Jesus. And now, and now <clears throat> there is this wide-hearted embrace, this embrace of Jesus by Peter. But, but there's this scene as well where, where as, as Peter looks, we're told in Luke 22, that, that as Peter denied Jesus that third and final time and the rooster crows, in Luke 22, verses 58 to 61, we're told that Peter and Jesus, they were able to see each other and Jesus looked he looked at Peter. And sometimes we, we get this impression, yes, there is a disappointment that we have sinned, that we have fallen short. But here is Jesus. And do you notice what he says? What does he say to Peter? Peter. He says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, Jesus has typically called him Peter. To, to revert back to this name, Simon, his name was Simon Peter, but to revert back to this name, Simon, son of John, there's something going on here. The name Simon means listen. Or, or hear. It's, it's the same word that, uh, it comes from the Hebrew word that, that has the idea of uh, to listen. So we hear that in the Shema. To, to, to hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And now Jesus, it's like he's saying to him again, Simon, I want you to listen. He doesn't call him Peter. The, the name Peter means rock. And, and Peter has had this this steadfastness about him that he's perceived about himself. I, I will never deny you, Lord. I'll never abandon you. I'll fight till the end. He's, he's got this deep kind of resolve. And Peter has this idea about himself that he is more confident and more sure and more steady than he actually is. He is thinking that he has more resolve in himself than he actually, does, than he actually does. But now... The impulsive Peter, the Peter who said, I will never deny you, now stands before Jesus, having done something that he never could have imagined that he would have done. I will never deny you? No, Peter. You denied your Lord three times. And so this man who thought he was a rock is shaky at best. And so Jesus says to him, Simon, listen to me. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, it's not clear. What does Jesus mean when he says, do you love me more than these? Is he referring to the fishing gear, the 153 fish after a, an unsuccessful night? Or is he referring to the other six disciples who are standing around by this fire? Well, if we set the scene, and if we think about what's going on, what we hear in Peter and what we see in Peter is that he is being asked this question over and over. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, for those of you who've heard sermons before, you've probably heard that there are different words for love, and so Jesus is changing the way that he's speaking about love here. Jesus speaking about agape love, and, and Peter responding with this friendship, affection type of love. But that's not the point of the language. In fact, as Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? There is this sense that Jesus is probing into Peter's heart. Just as Peter denied the Lord three times, there will be three questions so that Peter can confess three times, yes, Lord, I love you. You know. And Peter says, you know that I love you. And each time it becomes stronger and stronger until that third time where Jesus says, Simon, 
Son of John, do you love me more than these? He responds by, by, John says he was deeply grieved. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And here Christ looks deep into our hearts. He looks deeper than we can look into our own hearts. And he looks and he brings out our own weakness, our own failures, not to shame us or to guilt us or to humiliate us, but rather that we would not look to ourselves, but that we would look to him. You see, in Peter's confession, this final confession, it is not that Peter appeals to his sincerity, but he appeals to his Lord's sovereignty. Lord, you know everything. You know the deepest recesses of my heart. And so Jesus can say to Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, Feed my sheep. And he can say to Peter these things because in this moment of restoration, it is not just a restoration of his relationship, but it is also a restoration of his service. That Peter must first commune with Christ before he can serve Christ. That, that he must have this relationship where he dearly loves Jesus and he knows of Jesus' love for him before he can serve him. The Puritan pastor, Richard Sibbs, he was the one who actually trained and prepared Thomas Goodwin, who I mentioned earlier. He, he would look deep into the heart of Christ. And Richard Sibbs, he, he would see the, the great abounding mercy of God. And Richard Sibbs would say, there is more mercy in Christ than there is sin in us. Do you see that in the very heart of Jesus? Do you see that though your sins be great, His mercy is greater? We often sing that. My sins, they are many. His mercies are more. This is the very nature of our God. He, how can He embrace us so strong? Thomas Goodwin, again, he would say, it is natural for Him to show mercy, but punishment is His strange work because it is mercy that pleases Him. It is his delight to show mercy. It, it is what is abounding in him. That, that this is what flows out of him. What will make sinners run to Jesus? What causes them to jump over the side of the boat and swim to him? What causes you and me to be drawn to Jesus? Isn't it his beautiful, tender, loving, merciful heart? He is the Lord Jesus, the Son of the Father of all compassion and God of all mercies. It's who He is. And so Jesus can take sinners worn down, broken, dented, and dull. And He could take People whose lives look quite worn and messed. And when he asks us that question, do you love me? He invites us to take the sandpaper of confession and to be rubbing off those old ways. To, to allow our weaknesses to be exposed to one who doesn't in our vulnerability, take advantage of our weakness, but expose our weakness so that he might apply the healing, the healing balm, the restorative nature. And when he, when he takes us and we confess our sins as that, that 
rubbing of the sandpaper of confession feels so uncomfortable and so awkward. It is actually in that moment that we find that the tenderness of Jesus is that he does not take our confession and make us more vulnerable for the sake of us being humiliated, but so that that he might make us even better than who we are, that he might make us and form us into the image of his Son so that we can have the heart of Christ, the heart of Christ who receives and welcomes sinners so that you and I, that we might do the exact same and go and welcome sinners in Jesus' name.